Jeff Fuller with you. Thanks so much for making the time to uh, listen in and uh, join on YouTube, Jay Fuller Interviews on YouTube. You can certainly join the Facebook group, Jay Fuller Interviews, Instagram and Twitter, Jay Fuller Interviews, and now on all the podcast channels, Google Podcasts, iTunes, Apple. It's the Backfire Podcast with Jeff Fuller of Jay Fuller Interviews. And joining us now because people's stories make our stories better is the one, the only, Xavier McDaniel. Xavier, how are you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's good to have you on. Thank you uh, for making the time. Yes. Uh, thank you for having me on. Now, Thinking about an old guy. Now. <laughs> where are you located right now? I'm located in Columbia, South Carolina, but I live in Blackwood, South Carolina, which is just on the outskirts of uh, Columbia. I'm in, but it's just the same county, Richland County. So I understand South Carolina is where you grew up. Uh, what was it like playing high school back in the day? I think we got some of the best high school in, in the, uh, basketball in the country. A lot of people look at it as a football state when you're talking about, uh, you know, Sterling Sharp or Austin Jeffries or Javane and Clowney or Stephon Gilmore. You know, people see it as a, a football state, but – Basketball is very, very popular here. Xavier, how tall are you? I'm about six foot seven and about three four. So I'm a little under six eight. When, uh, and I played at 205 pounds. When did you get your growth spurt? Right out the middle school. I was about five nine, five ten in the middle school. And then all of a sudden that summer. Everything was too small. I went from like 5'11", 5'10", to like 6'1". And Coach Sai Sakachi, who just passed last year, uh, was talking to me, and he was like, you're the kid from Olympia, and I said, yes, sir. I heard a lot of good things about you. I was on the ninth grade team. It ain't like it is today where ninth graders are playing varsity. Uh, it's more high schools today. So a lot of kids are able to play varsity in the ninth grade. So I was playing against one of his guys, varsity guys, doing very well. And um, he was like, you're coming out for basketball, right? And I was like, yeah. I told him I play football, too. He's like, ah, shit. Ah. But so uh, later on that year, he looked at me again. He was like, and he was also the ninth grade coach. We had another coach, but sometimes – he couldn't make it, so Coach Side was a varsity coach would coach the B team. By the, by the end of the school year, I then grew to 6'4". And so I wind up being a on the JV first seven or eight games on JV. And then after that, I wind up um, moving up on varsity uh, in the, at the about eight games into my, my uh, JV season. I moved up to, to varsity and how I got moved up. It was kind of funny because Tyrone Corbin, high school team of mine, played in the NBA for a lot of years and he got moved up. And I was like, I felt like I was the best player on the team. And, you know, the coach said, well, you do, you, you believe that? I said, yeah. So he said, you're on varsity. I mean, I, I mean, I was averaging well over 20 points a game. You know, I was ducking the ball, and so he moved me on varsity three games later, hit my first game winner, and I was starting on varsity from that point on. So did you all – my junior year, I should say. Then I went <laughs> went back to the bench, had some academic problems. <laughs> did you, did you always have out. football-type shoulders, or is that something you had to really work on your body with uh, weightlifting and that sort? Oh. Uh, Honestly, I never lift weights. I never lift weights. I am strong, and I, I didn't care if you were Carl Malone, a guy who lift a lot of weights and 255 pounds. I was too old. I'm going to battle you. Hmm. I may not never get the credit from a lot of guys because a lot of people like to talk about guys like Michael Jordan or Dominique Wilkins. Um, I never got to that echelon like them but my numbers early in my career spoke for itself and then i started having some knee issues where i played on a bad knee my third year in the nba 
and I fully never really recovered from that. So, um, and I'm okay with that, but no one could ever take that. I will back down from there. And uh, I always just try to give it my best. So a quick shout out to Mark Epstein who uh, connected us. They call me Pathfinders. It's a new, uh -huh. new book. Right. Uh, just talk to me about the people you've met throughout your basketball journey. Does it ever surprise you when you look back to see some of the great contacts that, you, that you've been able to have a part of your life? Yeah, it's awfully amazing because I, I tell the story that a little black kid from Columbia, South Carolina, grew up in a small section called Eddie Stowe Court on the southeast side of uh, Columbia uh, near the fairgrounds. And um, never thought that my journey would lead me to a lot of places because the neighborhood was really, really tough. People talk about their neighborhood. Well, I put my neighborhood up against any of them. And so i um, seen a lot of things, a lot of negative things, but there were also a lot of great, great people in that neighborhood. A lot of great people that have passed on and went into the afterlife now, but there's a lot of friends of mine that are from that area that's still alive. So there's been a lot of good people. So there's bad people everywhere. And I've just been fortunate enough to be able to see some of the things leaving here on a bus going to South Carolina, I mean, going to Wichita, Kansas, and saying, whoa, it's a whole different world out here. Never been to the Midwest. Farthest I ever been was to Memphis and to Mississippi um, during my senior year. But I never thought in my wildest dream that I, it would take me all over the world, being to Greece, to Russia, to Israel, um, Italy, Spain, uh, Thailand, all over Asia I've been. Uh, it's, it's been a, a great, great journey. And I, I wouldn't trade it. I know some of the things, the physical part of the game where, you know, like now I walk with a limp because of my knee. But I, I wouldn't change it for nothing. I, it's, I mean, basketball is like, how can you not love it? You you wake up in the morning, and at 10 o'clock, you go play basketball, and you get paid for it. And and, and when I was with the Seattle Super Bowl, I'm getting paid $100,000 a month. How could you not love it? So for me, uh, being in that competitive aspect of meeting guys like Michael Jordan, which I already admit we were 19 before we any of us was famous, me and Carl Malone and Kyle Masters, uh, Kyle, yeah, Kyle Masters from Kentucky. I think it was Kyle Masters. Uh, I may be getting his last name, but it's Kyle something. Hmm. Played for Kentucky, white guy, shooting guard. We were uh, all sweet mates in um, in uh, Colorado Springs, where I was I was 19, 19 years old. I think Carl was about nineteen, and uh, it was it's it's you know guys like Sam Perkins. I mean, it, it, it's, it's been a great, great journey and just meeting people, not just in Columbia, but Charleston, South Carolina, where Mark Epstein is at and doing mm -hmm. some things with him in the low country, what we call it, going up to the up, upstate, doing things there too, and out in the PD area, Myrtle Beach area, doing things, and just around the world, period. And I, it's, just, it's just been a blessing. So Xavier, Xavier McDaniel makes some time. Before you were an NBA All-Star, you went to Wichita State. Why'd you choose Wichita? To make a long story short, because we could be here all day on this story. I, I originally was going to go to South Carolina. That was my original thought from the time I watched Alex English. And I want to say it was either 1976 or 75, 76 season. I watch him. A guy named Peter Ray McClinton used to get us tickets. We were at the boys' club, and he worked at the boys' club, and he would get us tickets to USC games. And it was the first time I seen him, and I told him years later that I was at that game when you gave your mother that basketball, and I said I vowed to myself that day I was going to break his record. And from that day forth, I, I've always wanted to be a Carolina guy. I mean, I used to emulate guys like uh, Clarence Williams and uh, Kevin Long, get names you may not never heard of. They play football. And George Rogers, and everybody knows George Rogers. Uh, and as a 14-year-old, I'm looking at them, those guys playing football and Alex English playing basketball. They were a little bit – well, uh, Kevin Long and, 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 and Clarence Williams were – 
George age, and then during my high school year, that's when George Rogers came as a freshman. So I was like, these are guys that I looked up to and that I want to be. I just want to be a part of the Carolina family. Didn't work out because I had some academic problems. I had some behavioral problems. Uh, from Like I said, from the neighborhood I was, it was a tough neighborhood. You had to learn how to throw them hands. And so um, I got in a lot of trouble. I was a starter as a sophomore. I went to the bench as a junior to get my academics up and and to be a model citizen, to be actual, you know, to be a model citizen in school. So during my senior year, I, all my rage that I had, I just took it out on opponents, hmm. you know, blocking shots, rebounding, dunking, and just being that force. And I went to this basketball camp called Bill Cronow Basketball Camp. Everybody used to call it BC Basketball Camp in Middleville, Georgia. Um, that's where I met Wayman Tisdale at, a lot of other players. Uh, Charles Barkley, a lot of us was down there. And that's when I first started getting recognized as a basketball player. And uh, then basically what happened, South Carolina reneged on a scholarship that they offered me. And I opened up my re- I opened up my recruiting and I went to Mississippi first to Memphis State. I went to Clemson and Wichita State was the last one. And, and, and I just started watching the tapes. Everything that I dream about doing, I seen it on the state. I went to Coach Smithson's house on that Sunday before my flight. I had breakfast with him and his wife and the assistant coach Jeff Jones. And he was like, Can you dribble? I was like, Yeah, but high school coach won't let me dribble. And he was like, I let all my big guys dribble. And he said, Can you shoot? I said, Yeah, but he don't let me shoot that often. He said, Do you make them? I said, Yeah, I shoot about it 70, 80% from the field, but I. If I take too many, he gets on me. So he was like, everything that I seen in the tape, bringing the ball up as a big guy, he allowed us, he let the guys do it. I'm, I'm watching Antoine Carr bring the ball up. He's 6'9". So I'm sitting there like, wow, this is this where I want to be. And I thought about it. My parents sit down and say, you know, you know, I know you got your friends, but as a man, sometimes you got to learn to move on. They felt like it was better for me to move somewhere where I didn't know a lot of people at first. It make me concentrate on basketball and academics. And basically, that's what happened. So I, I, did it. I said, Coach, I think I want to go to Wichita State. And, and I just had to wait on my grades to come in. We never announced it. When I finally announced it, grades came in like June 1st, like three days before my birthday. I came in, I had a 2.3 grade point average, and, you know, I already had took the SAT, and I didn't do very well on it, but back then, you only had to do with take it. Yeah. And I tell people all the time, I didn't do crap on that SAT, but I graduated from college. Yeah. And that's all that matters. Uh, I was a very poor test taker as well, and so we won't talk about SAT scores at all. <laughs> I'm a poor test taker, home take home homework taker, whatever you want to say. I was bad at all at times when I wanted to be. So, so I Xavier, understand. Xavier McDaniel making some time. What was more difficult, being the rebounding leader or the scoring leader at the Division One level? I don't know because I never kept the stats. Hmm. The only thing I know, if I had two rebounds in at halftime, my college coach would come to me and Jeff Jones say, well, Coach, Xavier only got two rebounds. And the only thing he would say to me was, you better have uh, answer rebounds at the end of the game. Hmm. And I would just go out and I'd just start snatching them. But sometimes <laughs> it was tough. Uh, you know, because you got two and three people, but I contribute what I did in the summer. I, I would always run three, four miles. I was in such great, great shape that um, it, it enabled me when guys were getting weaker, I got stronger. And um, I just I just never thought about it. The only time I thought about it is at halftime when they, and, and caught, caught my, my college coach never said nothing about points with me. They would always talk about rebounding. And, and my height, my, my coach would always say, Coach Smith would always say, you know, 
rebounding is what's got you in the starting lineup, and that's what's going to keep you there. Mm -hmm. So don't ever stop doing that, and and I will get back on the them boards, and that's all I would do. I would have two at halftime and have 22 at the end of the game. So it, I just think that was just my relentless, being relentless and my condition that I did in the summer. So the 1985 NBA draft, you were Same selected fourth. Fourth by the Supersonics. Uh, Patrick Ewing, Wayman Tisdale, Benoit Benjamin were before you. Were you surprised that you went so high? Right. Or do you think you should have gone higher? Oh, no. I, I, honestly, I knew Patrick. Everybody knew Patrick going to be number one. For, if he would have probably came out his high school year, he probably would have been number one. I mean, Patrick is a beast. I mean, he's always been a beast. But I felt like I, I could have been number two. But, you know, Wayman Tisdale had more accolades than me. You know, three-time first-team All-American, um, Olympian, uh, and uh, – Benoit Benjamin, I felt like I outplayed him two times in college. We we split, but I outplayed him both times. Uh, like 39 and 19 rebounds on him at Wichita State. Uh, I think I had like 24 and 14 in, in, in Omaha. Um, but it, it really doesn't matter where you go is what you do when you get there. You know, you look at a guy like Carl Malone and look at the illustrious uh, career that he had going like 13. It doesn't matter where you go. But I felt like I was the, the second best player in the draft. And I felt like I was probably more ready, probably even than Patrick Ewing because of the style of play. We played an NBA style of play at Wichita State. When I got there and it was calling plays, I was like, oh, shit, that's our number one play. Oh, this is our play. Now I just had to change the terminology. I knew the sets. I just had to change the names because hmm. the names were called something else at Wichita State. So I felt like I was more ready than anybody. I felt like I should have been rookie of the year that year because Patrick missed 32 games. I played 82 games. So I always say, Patrick, if you take my – what? What? You talking to me? You take my 32 worst games away, then my average would have been far higher than 17.1. Yeah. And I, we averaged almost the same rebound. I just felt like I should have been rookie of the year. Felt like I got robbed on that. And me and him been friends for since we met each other at age 19 and, and the Pan Am trials. We've been good friends. And and in 1985, 86. It's been almost, what, 30, 30 years, 40 years, 35 years, something like that, uh, that I lost it. And I still tell him all the time how my trophy doing. Because <laughs> I felt like I was rookie of the year. I felt like I was – I knew I was the second best player in the draft, but I felt like I was the most ready player out of anybody. And when you look at my numbers, you can see it's just the fact that I played on a, on a hurt knee where I tore my meniscus, I tore, tore my meniscus, I tore all the cartilage under my kneecap, and I played five months like that. Wow. And over the years, it came back to haunt me. Xavier, I, uh, told everybody I felt like I had a Hall of Famer career. Yeah. Hey, first of all, the first, you, five, first five or six years of my career. Tell your wife, thank you for driving. Uh, I'm enjoying uh, the fact that I get to talk to you and she's uh, your, chauff your chauffeur today. But um, I just got to ask, going to Seattle, <laughs> being so far from home, you talked a little bit about the rough patch you had in high school and how you had to refocus. Was it good being that far from home? And uh, what did you have to do to make sure you walk that, quote, straight and narrow when you were with the Sonics? Well, it taught me how to grow up taught me how to do certain things. My dad would use always tell my mama, you babying him. This neighborhood, you can't baby him. And every time he say he won't do this, and, you know, she tried to make it happen. And so uh, going away from home from Wichita to to Seattle, it just taught me how to grow up. And, and also had one of my best friends, I call him my cousin, and, I, and my brother was just getting out of the military. He came up there, so... And then my youngest sister, who got cancer right now, she came and lived with me. So I had plenty of support. 
and stuff. So, and then I will always have friends come up and visit me, you know, when they would get vacation and stuff. So uh, it was never that bad. Now the four years in high school, I mean, I'm college was, cause uh, uh, like I said, my friend, I called him my cousin. Uh, he, went, he, he came up there after my uh, freshman year and stayed there and we just roommate. Um, basically, you know, until I went back to South Carolina. So uh, I, I had plenty of support, man, and people to keep me in line and make sure that I don't stray off and stuff. So, and, you know, I was never one into to a lot of drugs and a lot of alcohol and stuff. I mean, my four years of college, I might have had maybe a, several drinks. I, I didn't even drink in college. Hmm. I did a, a little bit my freshman year, and that was it. And uh, and then in the pros, uh, I would all I just I always drank beer. I, I mean, I didn't drink a whole lot, but when I did, it was beer. I, I mean, like right now, even today, I hadn't even had a look of drink in like seventeen years. I just never liked the taste of it, hmm. so it was never something that I really really liked. But I really liked Coors Lights, especially when the Cowboys are winning, and I hate it when the Cowboys are losing. <laughs> it tastes a whole lot better when the Cowboys are winning, and right now we're struggling. So uh, did, it's did a difficult you, time for me right now. <laughs> when did you start shaving your head? Um, a lot of people say I started doing it in high school. That is a fabrication of a lot. Uh, my sophomore year, I think we were playing Tulsa. And we used to always go get hair because that's been something I've been doing ever since high school. Big games, I go get cuts. And James Gibbs, Arbor Sherrod, we were sitting at the barber, and we was like, man, they were talking about, let's get a barber. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. I was next in the chair. Well, I'm no longer got a bald head. <laughs> so I get to the game. I was mad. I get to the game, and people just loved it. And it said it made me look meaner. But you look at my eyebrows, you can see I don't, I've never had many eyebrows. And so people always thought I shaved those, but I don't. And I have never done that. So uh, I get to the game. I think we're playing Tulsa. And we beat the crap out of them. And I had like four or five hard rim dunks. And people just loved it. And it just kind of stuck. It just stuck. It just stuck with me. Uh, and now today, I, I, I was reading a Jet magazine, and they're talking about how Michael Jordan started the trend of ball years. I started to write them and say that was a lie, but you know I didn't even say nothing. But it, the trend started with with me. Uh, but the first guy that was ball headed in the NBA was Slick Watts. Yeah, yeah. And then after he retired, I came in the league. I think he retired in like '83. I came in the league two years later and started it. And now you see a whole bunch of guys with ball heads. Yeah. Everybody, I see Asian guys with ball heads. I see white guys with ball heads now. So it's it's a trend that uh, I started in 1983, and you know, and, and today you look at a lot of people, man. They get that receding hairline, and they cut it off. But you look at me; I can grow some hair. I, see. I, I usually cut my hair about every uh, 10 to 14 days. So uh, Slick Watts wore a headband. You never did that. Behind me, there's a picture of uh, Dale Ellis, and he's quite the shooter. Was quite the shooter. Can you just talk about the yeah. emergence of the three-point game in the NBA? Is that something that you wish you would have shot more of? No, because that wasn't my game. Bickerstaff wanted me to shoot a few more, but that wasn't my game. My game was mid-range. Yeah. You know, my game was staying within 17, 18 feet. I'm automatic. Post. When I'm struggling with the jump shot, I go to the post. And I use my, you know, I like that 44, the big one. That's okay. Um, but I, I mean, I, I mean, yeah, I probably could have probably shot a few more. I could have shot a few more, but that wasn't what I that wasn't what I was about. Uh, I just try to stay true. I want to tell kids today, stay true to your game. And you know, if the Houston Rockets was small, smarter, and the Antonio is a South Carolina guy from Myrtle Beach. I mean, if they would have shot the two a couple more times, they would have been in the NBA Finals for two years in a row. But you can't, you know, if you're going to live with it, you're going to die by it. I just think it's not a high percentage shot. Steph Curry's a great shot. Uh, who else I would say? Dale Curry, great shot. Yeah, yeah. Dale Ellis, 
great shot. Larry Bird, great shot. There's a lot of guys that could really, really shoot it. And there's a lot of guys like I look at James Harden, and I think that if he took a few better shots, he would be a great shooter. But when you know you're shooting 33%, you know, maybe in baseball that's pretty good. Three, three, you know, batting 330, 333, that's good. But basketball, you know, uh, you look at a guy like, you know, um, what's his name for play for Washington? He's on ESPN. Uh, great, great, another great shoot. He shot like 49%, 51%, you know. Uh, but it's not a very high percentage shot. And for me, I mean, I, I think I shot 26%. You know, if I would have shot another 7%, I might have, that would have put it today. That, you know, shooting 35% is a good shooter today. I just, I just didn't see that as a good shot for me. Hey, Xavier, talk to me a little bit. Behind me is that infamous picture of uh, you and Michael Jordan, but I remember a video that uh, Larry Bird told you exactly where he was going to shoot it and just about where he said he was going to shoot it. Mm-hmm. He actually shot and made it. The NBA, I've heard that you are a super <laughs> nice guy, but when you get on the court, you are certainly as competitive as anyone. What does it take to be a competitor in the NBA without yeah. backing down, with protecting your teammates? Talk about that right. aspect. Well, when I came into the league, everybody looked at me as this tough guy. Um, and I just played hard. I don't really think I'm that tough guy. I'm just not going to back down. Yeah. And you're looking at that picture in the back. I actually, Michael Jordan, we were saying tough you to each other. Now I asked him what he wanted to do. That's when, um, what's the man, the referee right there, uh, Jake. Jake came in there, and that's when he gave us both ticks. And, and, you know, as a 57-year-old guy, uh, now, and I was about 27 on there, I would have kicked Michael Jordan ass. All of Chicago model would have killed me. I, but at 57, you know, you're 27, you're thinking that. But at 57, I'm like, man, I'd have hit this icon. They would have probably assassinated me or something. And the Larry Bird story was uh, we were playing them, and I think we went up by one. I think Dale had scored, and we went up by one. And he was like, oh, it was a tie score. That's what it was, tie score. And uh, he was telling me, AX, I'm going to get this ball right here, and I'm going to shoot it in your fucking face. And I was like, yeah, I know you're going to get it. I'm going to be right here. We're fucking waiting on you, too. And you can see us talking shit to each other. And he came out and said, I told him. I'm coming to and what I should have probably fronted him. Uh, but I figured that I, you know, I was a lot stronger than him. I could bump him and try to get him get him off. But he hit me with a shot. If you go back and look at that shot, you see me lean just enough back yeah. for him to get off. You see me jump. And when he went through, he looked and said, damn, I didn't mean to leave nothing on the shot clock. I mean, on the clock. I look at him, this mother, I, this mother, I was like, God, damn. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be on highlight for the rest of my life. <laughs> so, I mean, Larry Bird, man, great, great player. Another Missouri Valley brother. Um, Nothing but respect for him. The way he plays, he plays hard, aggressive, do whatever it takes to win. You got to admire those type of guys. So, Xavier, a couple questions, then we'll uh, get you out. And thanks again for just making the time and being a part. And that's simply, uh, when did you realize, not that you were going to retire from professional basketball, but when did you feel as though your body had had enough and so you kind of just stepped away from uh, playing pickup basketball or just hanging out with the guys and running up and down a court? When I saw myself on the bench, <laughs> uh, <laughs> man, I didn't mind being on the bench, but I just wanted to contribute a little bit. And that's why, uh, one of the reasons why, if someone would have told me they'd give me 12 minutes, I just wanted like 12 to 15 minutes a game. And I, I mean, it was never about the money. It was never about the money. I never played for the money. I always played because I loved the game. And I, I continue to play basketball, even with a hurt knee, until I was in my 40s. I think the last time I dunked, I was about 46 years old. I hadn't tried it since then. Well, I know I can't do it now, 57, but uh, it just. You know, I just I just knew that regulation. Also, knew my days were numbered. 
and stuff uh, with, with what went on with NFL for myself. Uh, I just wish that uh, things would have worked out a little bit better in New York. I knew we had championship team, but I knew I was going to New, uh, Boston. Unfortunately, Reggie Lewis died. Yeah, you know we won 50, 51 games that year, and Reggie Lewis passed away. And I think our organization just panicked. And, and you know, like me and L. Carr, they made him vice president. And I, to this day, I, I still want to whoop his ass. He don't know. He don't know. I'll meet him fucking anywhere because you don't play with God's career, you know. And because I don't agree with what you're doing, you know, I, I have an opinion. That's why I love guys like LeBron James and these guys in this era that, that they have opinions. And, and people respect them. In the 80s and 90s, management did not respect you. And and he's a former player. And that what made it so difficult that ML was a former player and he did not respect my opinion and stuff. And 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 basically, basically just put me in the game, have put me in the game, take me out. You know, you don't do guys like that. And and then like I told Chris Ford, and I respect Chris Ford to this day. And because he, he, he let me say what I wanted to say. And I said, Chris, when they fire you, they ain't going to say this and that. They're going to say they're going in another direction. You didn't do the job. So whatever you're going to do, you do it yourself the way you want to, regardless you play me or not. And so uh, I, I respect Chris for it because he allowed me to have my opinion and stuff. But the ML, I would always have a dislike for him. He could not never, never see me in Boston on the street. Even though I hadn't been to Boston but one time in like 15 years, 20 years or so. So, uh, but I, I love the people in Boston. The people have always been great. And uh, I, I, I enjoy myself there. But I I, uh, I I realized that my time was numbered that, that last year in Boston. So, Xavier, I'll get you out on these two questions. Thanks again for making the time, Xavier. Daniel, uh, joining us, Jay Fuller interviews on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all over social media, where Xavier is not on social media. But who was your favorite teammate or who are a couple guys that you just uh, became brothers with as you played in the NBA? Um, when I was in Seattle long before me and Dale Ellis got in a little altercation. Me, Dale Ellis, and Nate McMillan was, and Tom Chambers were probably some of my closest friends. A lot of people in Seattle used to write. But me and Tom would always eat dinner after our games, just about all, the, just a lot of the times. We were very, very good friends. Tom was one of the first people at the airport when I got traded to Phoenix, even though it didn't work out in Phoenix. Um, Sadell so three was a good friend. Uh, Patrick Ewan, definitely. We've been we've been we've been cool since we were nineteen. Like I said earlier, uh, but those are some of the few people. When I was in New Jersey, Sam Cassell, uh, he always checked on me. Hmm. He always called me. Him and Jimmy Jackson, those guys always call and check in. Jimmy cursed me out because I didn't call him when I came to L.A. to the Sam. I was in L.A. For, for All-Star Weekend hanging out, and I did not call them, and, boy, they chewed me out. And um, But those are some of the guys that I had a great relationship. When I was playing, I had a great relationship with Kerry Ke Kittles, somebody I would like to probably reconnect with, good kid, great family. Um, you know, when I was in New Jersey with him, and I hadn't seen him in, whoo, 20 years. So, uh, but, you know, you, you, you know, guys go off to where they were from and go back like myself and stuff. So, you know, and me and Tyrone Corbett have always been, been cool with each other. I mean, we've known each other since we were 13 years old playing against each other. They call it King Park now, but it was Valley Park back in the day when we were playing and going up against each other and, 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 and playing against each other from middle school, his middle school, Creighton, and I went to Olympia Middle School uh, playing against each other back in the day. So I uh, still talk with a few people, but, you know, uh, those are just some of the guys that I talked to. 
So, Xavier, the final question I have for you, if you never played professional basketball, what would you have done for a career? I think I could have been a pretty good baseball player. If you talk to people in my neighborhood and people in Colonia, I was a pretty good baseball player. <laughs> you know, the, the fact is that I just kept growing. And besides, at the time in high school, what would be the tallest player would be maybe a Dave Winfield mm -hmm. when he played for Minnesota and the Yankees, 6'5". There wasn't a lot of six seven baseball players. But by the time the mid-80s came, you got Mark Aguirre, Jose Canseco. You got a lot of guys. You know, I looked at Ken Griffey, and I knew him in Seattle, and I was like, man, you like 5'10", you hit that damn ball at four. <laughs> so I, w I was amazed at how small he was and how far he – and I, I felt like I was a pretty good player. The ball was stuck with it. Most people in my neighborhood, they would tell you they would never thought that I would be a basketball player. Everybody thought I was going to be a baseball player. I played baseball for nine years. Before I went to college, played all the way up until I went to college. Well, Xavier, thank you so much for making the time. It was certainly a privilege and an honor for me. You're one of my uh, heroes when I was a kid, just watching you play. It was just awesome to see how fierce you were. You didn't back down. And I just loved how you would uh, dunk or play defense. Whatever the team needed you to do, you could score. You did it all. So uh, thanks for making the time today. Yeah. Uh, thank you for having me on anytime. For a fact. And again, that's Xavier McDaniel makes up time. My name is Jeff Fuller. Uh, we thank you so much for being a part. Jay Fuller interviews on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all over. Just